following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. The Arcanum 7 depicts a warrior standing in a chariot. This warrior holds in his two hands a staff or a rod and a sword. The chariot has four columns. which he stands amongst, or in the midst of. And the chariot is drawn, or led, by two sphinxes, one black and one white. This arcanum symbolizes the chariot of war, which is also represented in the the famous epic story of ancient India, which is called the Mahabharata. Bharata means war, and Maha, of course, is great. So the Great War is an ancient story which describes a huge conflict amongst members of a family. The most famous extract or portion of this epic story is called the Bhagavad Gita, which means the Song of the Lord. And this is a dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna. And they have this dialogue in a chariot on a battlefield at the very precipice of the greatest war the world has ever known. Of course, typically, traditionally, the story is interpreted as merely a story. And the symbolism is missed by the majority of the readers of the Mahabharata. The war itself, of course, is the jihad. It's the war that the initiate has to undergo within the mind. The war amongst the family, between the virtuous brothers and the greedy and proud brothers. Of course, the greedy and proud ones outnumber the virtuous ones in us and in the Mahabharata. But this dialogue that unfolds between Arjuna and Krishna begins because Arjuna, who is the greatest warrior amongst his family, 
of pure brothers. Arjuna has the responsibility of riding out onto the battlefield in order to initiate this great war. And when he faces the army of his brothers, of his family members, and he sees all of these beloved ones that he has to kill, he hesitates and he feels conflicted and asks Krishna, his advisor, his guide, how can I kill my beloved ones, my own family? How do I discover my true duty when I'm faced with this great conflict where my duty is to kill those that I love? How do I resolve that? And Krishna gives him the song of the Lord, the Bhagavad Gita, which is this discourse explaining the duty of the initiate, the duty of the spiritual practitioner. It's a beautiful story. But the chariot that they ride in is represented also in the Western tradition here in the seventh arcanum of the sacred tarot. And in this image, we see the warrior who stands in his chariot holding his sword and his staff. The symbol here is multifaceted and very deep. For us to begin to penetrate into the meaning of this symbol, we first have to examine some basic laws which exist in nature, which exist in all of creation. And truly, the exposition of all of these arcana is really the examination of all the varying laws that we have to come to understand. The term self-realization has a very specific meaning whose true interpretation is easily overlooked. To realize is to know directly, to have profound insight or an intuitive understanding. Realization is the epiphany of understanding this is the moment in which comprehension blossoms within the mind. And by self, we have to understand that what we seek on any true spiritual path is to realize or comprehend the real self, our true self. This realization is not limited to an intellectual idea. It has to be a kind of epiphany of the consciousness where we comprehend and understand directly what the nature of the real self truly is. The obstacle that we have to achieve that is our own false self. So to comprehend and understand and enter into the understanding, the knowledge of the real self requires that we abandon the false one. We've created and become trapped within a false sense of self because we don't understand the laws of nature, the laws which govern our own consciousness and the nature of our own soul. So the examination of the 22 arcana is the beginning of, of our own consciousness grasping the essential nature of each of the primary laws which manage nature. Each arcanum is a law. Each arcanum contains and encodes vital structures which manage energy in nature. So in order for us to achieve self-realization, we have to become one with those laws to realize those laws, to act in harmony with them, and to have our every motion, our every movement, 
our every thought and feeling be harmonious with those laws. We've arrived at the seventh of 22. And in the first six, we've looked at very elevated, somewhat abstract presentations of different aspects of the function of nature, the functions of energy and matter. One of the primary laws that we have examined is the law of three. The law of three is the law which creates. And this law is visually depicted in the uppermost triangle of the tree of life. And we have in this triangle three forces. Three aspects of one divinity. The law of three is required in any expression which seeks to manifest something else. This is a law of harmony, a law of equilibrium, a law of balance. So when three forces are brought into this state of equilibrium, creation occurs. When we look at our own inner psychology, the structure of our soul, we know that this law of three is the solar logos, the supernal father, the supermonad. It is the father of our father, the most elevated region of manifestation, beyond which is the unmanifest. But this light of the solar logos, which is our own inner star, the depths of our own consciousness, has to be organized. There is that expression of light, which is one, which is three. But in order for that expression to manifest further, to actually act, it has to be organized. And so that organization, the organization of that expression, is what we call the law of seven. And the law of seven is visually depicted in the lower seven spheres of the tree of life. So two triangles of three plus a seventh, which hangs below. The first triangle also encodes three forces. And this is the triangle of the monad. Monad comes from the Greek monas, which means unity. So again, we have three as one, one as three. <clears throat> the monad, in this case, is our own individual inner father. Three aspects of one intelligence. This is the warrior itself who rides in the chariot. The warrior, the fighter, is our own inner spirit, our own monad, our own individual, unique, divine father, who we also discussed in the first arcanum. The magician. You may begin to notice that we don't appear very much in all of these symbols. There's been a tendency, especially amongst certain groups, to always relate symbols, images, and laws to the personality, to the terrestrial person. But this personality, the terrestrial person, is the false self. To realize the true self, we have to get beyond the personality and realize that these symbols and structures and laws really correspond to the true self, our innermost. So the warrior in the seventh arcanum is differentiated from the first for a particular reason. 
In the first arcanum, we were examining the letter Aleph, the Hebrew character, and how this character has in its very structure the law of three. It has three essential components. And the magician, our own innermost, works with these three forces in order to dominate and control nature, to become a perfected Aleph, a perfected man. But the innermost, as number seven, is the warrior that's working with the law of seven. It's working with the, sto- the sword and the rod, the staff, in his two hands. Working in his chariot, in other words. The chariot is his vehicle. It is the Merkaba, or the soul itself. So if we break down this triangle of the monad, the second triangle on the tree, we would say that our canum seven rests on the seventh sphere, counting upwards, which is chesed. This is atman, or our own innermost. This is the number seven. He is the one riding in the chariot. But the chariot itself is all of the seven bodies which are below. The seven itself is the atmic body, the body of the innermost. The sixth is Gebera, which is the buddhic body, or the body of the consciousness. The fifth is Tifereth, which is the causal body, or the body of will, the human soul. These three, five, six, and seven, counting upwards, are the bodies of the monad. They are one, but three. Going further, we have netzach, which is the mental body. We have hod, which is the astral body. Yasod, which is the vital, and Malkut, which is the physical body. These lower four are what are called the inferior quaternary, which means quaternary is four aspects, four faces. These are the four bodies of sin. Physical, vital, astral, and mental. And these four bodies are illustrated in our graphic by the four columns of the chariot. The Atman, our own inner self, our own innermost, for him to fight on the battle, the battlefield of self-realization, has to dwell within the four bodies. He has to fight within his own vehicle. This is what he uses to ride into battle, to defeat the enemy. The enemy is Shaitan, Satan, the devil, who is, of course, ourselves, our own egos. The seven brothers, the seven aspects of the soul are these seven bodies. And the Mahabharata, they're depicted as five, which are the lower five. Causal, astral, mental, vital, physical bodies. Krishna, in this case, represents the Christ in the Mahabharata. But the essential symbol here is that the inner self who rides in the chariot has to inhabit and drive the four lower bodies. 
the inferior quaternary. He has to be in charge in order for the battle for self-realization to proceed well. This becomes our difficulty. Who is in charge of our mind? Who is driving the thoughts that we are experiencing from moment to moment? If you observe and examine your thoughts, look in them to see what is the will behind this thought. If you examine your feelings, look with this analysis. What will is behind this emotion? And if you examine your impulses to act, you have to analyze what is the force of will driving this impulse. What makes me want to act this way? Is it the monad? Is it my own inner self who's pushing me through this thought, through this feeling, through this impulse? Or is it my ego? It's in this effort from moment to moment, that we begin to establish the presence of the being within. And this effort is called self-observation, self-remembering. To observe oneself is to be present and watchful from moment to moment, watching all of the varying manifestations that arise in our minds, in our hearts, in our bodies. That watchfulness requires the vigilance of a warrior. One instant of distraction is enough for the enemy to get in. For the enemy, shaitan, to take control of our own psyche, to control the chariot, in other words. The thoughts that we have are related, of course, to the mental body which is one aspect of the chariot that the monad needs to drive. When, the own, when our own demon of the mind is infiltrating our camp, he pushes through our intellect, through thoughts, through ideas, his agenda, which is always rooted in desire, and which is always veiled with justifications, with good reasons, with strong arguments. The demon of the mind is very cunning, very convincing, very logical, very smart. This demon, of course, is represented in the Christian gospel by Pilate. who, as you know, appears sympathetic to the Christ in the Gospels. He appears to care. He appears to be concerned for the welfare of the Christ. He appears interested, inquisitive, curious. But in the end, he betrays the Christ and rationalizes his betrayal with reasoning. He washes his hands of guilt. Our own mind does the same thing. In appearing to be sympathetic to the cause of our inner being, by appearing to be curious about the nature of the teachings, by appearing to be very logical and reasonable and rational in all his ideas, but when our own demon of the mind controls that vehicle, the innermost cannot act. And we proceed to behave in wrong ways. The same is true of the demon of desire. 
the demon of evil will. These other aspects of our own mind, which are the three traitors. And these three traitors exist in us. They're not fantasies. They're not theoretical. They are living, breathing, scheming aspects of our own mind, which are in every moment seeking opportunity to take control of the chariot. The being himself has to fight to establish control over his chariot. He does this with the sword and the staff. The sword is a symbol of willpower. The staff is the symbol of the spinal column. Whoever wants to be a magician, writes our master Samael Envior, has to acquire the sword. How does one acquire the sword? How does one become a magician? Well, you remember from the first arcanum that the magician is the innermost himself. The first arcanum. To become that is to become self-realized. The sword is willpower. Will, we know, is related to Tiferet, the human soul. Whoever so, whosoever wants to become a magician has to acquire the sword, will, Tiferet, the causal body, to become soul, to become human soul. To become that, to acquire the sword, implies different things. The sword is the kundalini itself. It is the transmuted sexual power, which rises up the spinal column, is grasped by the innermost, and becomes his force, his expression, which he uses to conquer his enemies. The sword, in this case, represents the fires of the kundalini, which are risen and used to dominate shaitan, to destroy the enemy. And this is illustrated throughout the Bible, in all the great battles, when the Lord descends and empowers his warriors to conquer the unbelievers. These are all symbolic. Symbolic of initiatic processes that the aspirant has to go and follow through. This is all rooted in will. And Tiferet, as we know, is related to the character Vav, or Val, which we examined in a previous lecture. This character, Vav, or Val, is related to the sword that the magician is holding in his hand, and is related to Tiferet. Vav, in this case, symbolizes, of course, the spinal column as well. But in relation to Arcanum 7, it is the human soul. Now, if you notice on this graphic of Arcanum 7, the character Zain looks very much like Vav. They're very similar. There's a very subtle difference between them. The innermost has to have Vav and Zayin in his hands in order to do battle. Zayin is Budi, is Neshima, is the divine soul, Gebra. Here you have the monad itself working in battle. The innermost Atman, the number seven. And in his two hands are his two souls, divine and human. Zain and Vav. The Bible states that when God creates man, 
God breathed into the dust this form of clay, the breath of life, the neshima. This is the zayin. But in this case, we have to examine what is the distinction between vav and zayin? How do we understand how this relates to the number seven? The number seven is that law which organizes nature. We see the law of three creates the light of consciousness, our own Glorian. That law of three is organized into the seven bodies of our soul, the seven bodies of the innermost, which is the chariot itself. That organization is a descent of light, a descent of energy. This is the force of Aleph, the magician, the three forces, descending through Vav, the spinal column, elaborating the chariot itself. So these are sexual forces, creative forces, being organized in order to manifest the human being. But to become perfected, to become self-realized, requires a complementary process. The sexual forces have to be organized in order to create the soul as a self-realized entity. This is happening through the, the arising transmuted sexual forces, which are Zayin itself. So we can say Vav, in this example, demonstrates the descent of that energy to elaborate the structure. Zayin is the arising of that force to elaborate the perfection. Zayin, or Neshima, is the feminine sexual forces. Neshima is our own consciousness, buddhi, who is the aspect of the innermost which provides us with intuition, with insight, with intelligence. Vav is his will. Zain is his imagination, intuition, comprehension. In order for the innermost to conquer the enemy, he has to have a warrior, a fighter, a servant. He has to have his chariot. The innermost works through us To realize the self is to realize that. Is to come into harmony with the will of our own inner being. This has nothing to do with any kind of terrestrial morality or terrestrial laws or any kind of tradition. The will of the innermost is individual, is unique. The innermost that we have has his own solar personality, his own idiosyncrasy, his own mission. And for the terrestrial person, we have a role to play in the fulfillment of that mission. But we have to understand how to perform our duty to work on behalf of the innermost and fulfill that mission, that duty. In order to do that, it's important and necessary that we understand how these laws function. This understanding of the chariot is vital. The understanding of the spiritual soul and the human soul is vital. The understanding of the law of three and the law of seven is vital. 
in order for us to understand how to act properly in relation to the will of our inner being. The sword and the rod in the hands of the magician, the warrior, have an additional implication. Buddhi, or Neshima, is that feminine aspect of our own monad. And Buddhi is the light which expresses the will or the information from the innermost. Buddhi Buddhi means literally intelligence, but it's intuitive intelligence. So Buddhi in this case is that intelligence or that light which provides insight or intuition. The insight or intuition of the innermost is acquired in us through the vehicle of Neshima. But that vehicle cannot be accessed without Zain in us. And what that means Zayin is the seventh letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's the, it's the letter that corresponds to organization. It is also related to the seventh day, Shabbat. And to say seven, we say Shabbat, Sheba, related to the queen of Sheba. So Zayin, Gebra, Neshima are related to feminine sexual forces, intuitive forces, illuminating forces, which have to be gathered, respected, cultivated. The forces of that light the forces of that intelligence are dissipated when the sexual forces are expelled from the body. In other words, people who fornicate lose their capacity to acquire real insight. That's the bottom line. Through chastity, through upright sexual behavior. The forces of the Ishim, the Ishak, the Isha, the forces of the feminine sexual power are accumulated, fortified, and begin their ascension, represented by Zayin. There is a process which unfolds, a process of creation, when these three forces, encompassed and embodied within our own sexual waters, are harnessed by the chariot, by the warrior within the chariot, the innermost. When he fights in order to transform those energies and create his chariot create his soul. Without the without access to those waters, that form of creation cannot occur. In other words, we can say the three forces of divinity descend into us and have their ultimate refinement in our sexual forces. These sexual forces are our own expression of creation. The most powerful creative capacity that we have is all encompassed in our sexual force. 
When we use that force of creativity under the guidance of the demons of the mind and heart and sex, we create. But we create by causing those forces to continue descending. Because the will driving that creation is descending. It's a will that belongs to the klipoth, to the lower realms of nature, to hell. In other words, when we are acting out of desire, when we're acting from anger, or from pride, or from envy, we're harnessing the forces of the sex through those actions in the mind, in the heart, physically, but to create downwards. Psychologically, we understand that this is how the forces of the Divine Mother are descending into a negative polarity. There are two ways to create, positively or negatively. There are two ways for that raw creative power to be polarized, in other words. There are two ways for our creative expression to be organized, according to the Law of Seven. The way we normally behave in the society today, we take these three forces and we create according to instinctive impulses, animal desires, driven by pride, driven by lust, driven by fear. To create in this way is to take the three forces descending from above, which are manifesting and being expressed through our three nervous systems, the law of three, which are being organized by our seven chakras, the law of seven, by our seven bodies, the law of seven, which have their expression polarized negatively. In other words, when we listen to animal mind, to animal desire, to lust, to pride, to envy, to those demons that we have within, we create in the klipoth. We create in hell. On a psychological level, this means when we listen to our pride, we're taking our own vital forces and feeding the pride and creating more. When we're acting on our anger, we're taking our vital sexual forces and feeding the anger and creating more. This falls, in its ultimate synthesis, into the negative manifestation of these energies, which fall roughly into two large realms, Lilith and Nahima. Lilith and Nahima, it's said in the ancient traditions, were the two wives of the fallen Adam. Adam, of course, in this example, represents us. We are fallen from Eden, from perfection. we're fallen into suffering. And we are betrothed or intimately involved with our own animal desires, with our own inner lilith, our own inner nahima. These two represent how the feminine sexual forces create negatively by force of will, which is our will. How does this happen? When those sexual forces, when the forces of divinity 
descend into us. They are descending as represented by Vav, which I mentioned before. This character representing the spinal column. And that force of Vav is channeling or receiving these forces, the three forces. And those forces are gathered and accumulate in our sexual organs, which are the potency that we have. But when we take that potency and we harness it with desire, when we fulfill the desires of the instinct and we fornicate, that energy is polarized negatively immediately. So those three, that three-aspected sexual force which is descending, called the three breaths, is forced downward. It pushes the energies further down. It cannot return because it's been polarized negatively. That creative expression takes the intimate virtues which are inherent in the consciousness and polarizes them negatively. Let me back up one second so you can understand what that means. The being himself is the receptor of the divine light coming from above, from the solar logos, from the Glorian. That light has as its very essence the virtues of divinity. Now the purest virtue, the purest aspect of that is Christ itself, which is love. Pure. But when it's organized... It becomes the seven virtues of the soul, the seven virtues that we know, seven great attributes, which are, let me give them to you in order. Altruism, diligence, chastity. Humility, love, or charity, philanthropy, happiness for others, and temperance. These seven virtues are related to how the light of the cosmic Christ is organized into the psyche. When that light is descending into us, it can provide an influence. It can provide gifts. It can provide guidance through Neshima. But when we fornicate, when we listen to the animal desires of the mind, that ray, that light, that force is inverted. That light can no longer return upwards in order to express in the right way. It's polarized. So all of those virtues invert themselves and become their opposites. So where we, where we should have altruism, we have avarice. Where we should be showing and in our actions manifesting diligence, we, didn't, we manifest laziness. Where we should have chastity, we have lust. Where we should have humility, we have pride. Where we should have love or charity, we have anger or hate. Where we should have happiness for others and philanthropy, we have envy. And where we should have temperance, we have gluttony or greed. <clears throat> These seven... Polarized forces are an expression of will. They are accessed, they are emboldened, they are empowered by the human soul through action. That's our responsibility. 
That is our job. To choose. How do we behave? By what will do we act? Under what influence? This is a moment-to-moment -moment decision that we make. This is not a kind of statement we make to ourselves or belief. I believe I'm doing the right things or I believe I'm a good person, I'm headed the right direction. It's not that simple. We have to make these decisions every moment. In each moment, we're deciding how to harness the energies that are flowing into us. How are we harnessing those forces? How are we using them? Each moment, each thought, each feeling, each impulse. Each thought, each feeling, each impulse represents the arrival of new energy. The presence of energy that needs to be used and directed, but directed by will. Whose will? The will of the innermost or the will of the animal mind? This becomes our question. This becomes our effort. This is how the terrestrial person becomes a reflection of the innermost. By first becoming a warrior. The path begins in us when we begin to fight our own mind. When we begin to work towards acquiring the sword. But the sword is not something, not something out of our reach. We begin to use our will in the right way. We're using the sword. When we're using our will in the wrong way, we're using a sword in the wrong way. So the question for us becomes learning in ourselves how we create negatively or positively. How are we harnessing the forces that are available in our psyche, in our bodies? In the Bible it says, let me find it. Through Ishot, Chokmah builds the house. Chokmah, of course, is the Christ, wisdom. The house, of course, is the chariot itself. So we know Christ is the one, ultimately, who builds because it's the Christic energy which becomes elaborated through force of will. But that energy here is called ishot, which are feminine sexual forces. But how are we going to build that house if we're fornicating, if we're corrupting those forces with desire? We cannot. The forces of ishot, those feminine sexual forces, have to be purified through transmutation. This is the work that we have to perform as a warrior to begin to fight against shaitan, our own mind. To fight against the desires that arise in our three brains. And to begin to organize the energies into virtue. We do that by stealing the fire from the devil by stealing the forces that would otherwise be used for wrong action. This is accomplished by understanding an ancient alchemical mystery. In alchemy, medieval alchemy, there was always this discussion of vitriol.
Vitriol is a seven-lettered word which actually hides a sentence. This is called an acrostic, which means it's something that each letter is actually a word. Vitriol stands for visita interiora terre rectificando in vienis occultum lapidum, which is Latin. And in English says, visit the interior of the earth, which by rectifying you will acquire the philosophical stone, the hidden stone. This is the secret method of alchemy. The earth, of course, is our own self. On earth as it is in heaven. By looking into our own earth and rectifying that. To rectify means to return back to what it should be. When we make a mistake, we have to rectify it. We have to fix it. We have to make it right. This statement is saying our own earth is corrupt. We have to correct it. We have to purify it. And that's why in alchemy, there was always the discussion of turning lead into gold. Lead, of course, is a very dense metal. And this statement is saying... Remove the impurities. Purify the metals. The metals are these seven defects. The metals are our own mercury, which is corrupt. We purify the mercury by applying heat, by working with fire. And that fire is sexual. We elaborate the gold and perfect the gold in the heat of the laboratory the athenor in the furnace. And that furnace is sexual alchemy. It is a forge. The same forge that Vulcan uses in the Greek mythologies to provide weapons to the warrior, the son of Athena. If you're familiar with the Greek mythology, Athena is the goddess of war. Wisdom. But she is the Divine Mother. And she carries with her a shield and a sword. She provides these weapons to her son, who is the initiate. But the weapons are created by Vulcan in the forge of alchemy. He does it out of love. And this is the prerequisite for alchemy, for success in alchemy, is love. So vitriol is indicating that we need to rectify our earth in order to find the philosophical stone. But what is that? Well, in alchemy, the philosophical stone was a magical device or property which had all kinds of powers. Powers of healing, powers of immortality, powers over nature. Powers to command the elements. If you look into the stories, the histories of alchemy, you'll see a very interesting phenomena. The alchemists, the alchemists were always describing turning lead into gold and creating this stone which had magical powers. Naturally, When you observe and investigate this story, this history, you see many people driven by greed, by envy, by lust, chasing that philosophical stone. Kings, emperors, popes, princes, leaders, all levels of society. We're all desperately trying to find the secret technique so they could create gold, so they could create diamonds, all driven by greed, by pride, by envy. 
So naturally, they did not find the real meaning of the symbol. Instead, they created what we now know of as chemistry. And still, those same people are still chasing these desires. The symbol of alchemy is that we have to transform the lead of the ego, the lead of these seven defects, into gold. The gold of the spirit. The gold of the golden bodies. The solar bodies. We work in the forge of alchemy in heat and pressure fighting against our own mind, against desire, in order to extract what is pure from what is impure. The sword of the innermost, given to us by our Divine Mother, Athena, is the weapon used to conquer the impurities, who are all our brothers on the battlefield, all of our family, which represent our own egos, parts of ourselves that we believe we love, that we're attached to, that we're identified with, that we are in conflict because we don't want to kill them, just like Arjuna. Krishna advises Arjuna, do your duty. Understand that what you're doing is for me. Understand that what you're doing is your responsibility, is right action. You have to act. And so Arjuna does it. We have to follow that example. To be brave, courageous, and wield the sword provided to us by our Divine Mother in order to conquer our pride, to conquer our anger, to conquer our lust. We accomplish that in two ways, by two vital aspects, both of which are symbolized in this card. We see the monad in his chariot with his sword and his rod. We see two sphinxes, black and white. There is a duality that has to be harnessed. The two sphinxes represent masculine and feminine sexual forces. The masculine and feminine sexual forces have also two levels of meaning. They are man and wife, male and female, or as the Bible calls them, ish and Isha. Male sexual forces, female sexual forces. We have to harness the balancing, we have to balance and harmonize the feminine and masculine sexual forces. This is the basis of alchemy. By doing so, by containing and harnessing the sexual forces in transmutation, we're empowering the warrior in the chariot, providing him with the fuel and force he needs to battle the enemy. Another level here is that the monad has to do this through his divine soul, and his human soul. Feminine and masculine aspects. The sword and the rod. But how do we personally do it? We know we have to transmute sexual forces. We have to understand and engage in the science of chastity. Taking and harnessing our sexual forces and working with them in the right way. If we're part of a marriage, if we're married, 
we learn how to practice alchemy in order to not hurt each other and hurt ourselves. For a single person, we learn how to harness our own sexual forces through practices like pranayama in order to transmute those forces and prepare ourselves for marriage. But in addition to the transmutation that we have to perform, we have to also use these two aspects of the monad in ourselves, Tifereth and Geberah. Or in other words, willpower and imagination. We have to meditate. We use our sword, our will, or that masculine projective force of Tiferet by concentrating in meditation. Meditating on ourselves. Meditating on our mistakes in order to rectify our earth. This is a masculine effort. Masculine in the sense that it's a force of projective will. It's an effort. And in the beginning, it takes a lot of effort because the mind is out of control. We have to dominate the donkey of the mind. In Zen, it's symbolized by a bull. In Tibetan Buddhism, it's symbolized by an elephant. In Gnosis, by a donkey. In each case, it's an animal, which is powerful and stubborn. And anyone who's tried to meditate knows that's true. So the first aspect is will, to meditate, to concentrate. To sit there and do it, even though your mind is doing everything it can to convince you to stop. Giving you pain in your leg, in your back. Making you feel agitated. Making you think, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. I have all these other things I need to do first. Making you think, I can't do it. It's impossible. This is too hard. Or making you think, I don't know how to do it. No one's taught me. I need a better teacher. The mind will give you a million reasons to not meditate. It takes will to do it. But it also requires the feminine influence, a feminine force. And that is coming to us through Neshima, through Bodhi. This is imagination. This is the receptive aspect of meditation. We use will to sit, to concentrate, to observe. But then we also have to call in Neshima to receive, to comprehend, to understand. These two aspects, in Gnosis we talk about will and imagination. And combined, they produce ecstasy, comprehension. If you meditate only with will, only with concentration, you will achieve some stability. On the other hand, if you meditate only with imagination, you might achieve some vision, some insight, but you will lack stability. You have to combine the two. And meditation requires practice, experience, something you have to taste for yourself. In Buddhism, this force of will to concentrate is called shamatha, or in Tibetan, shine. This is having stable, peaceful mind, which is developed through concentration. When we have that, to some degree, we also have to receive. This is called vipassana. This is the... hmm? 
It's Kabbalah, to receive information. It's from Kabel in Hebrew. So you see here two fundamental aspects which need to be unified in meditation. In other words, we have to practice. We have to fight. We have to work constantly, consistently, persistently in order to rectify our own earth. Meditation is not something that is acquired through reading. The guidance of the being is not acquired through reading. Meditation is not acquired by talking to other people or by going to different schools. Neither is the will of the being. The will of the being cannot be gathered through the opinions of others. Meditation is the means to acquire the guidance of our innermost. It is the means to acquire the intuitive understanding we need to rectify our own earth. It is the means to acquire the ability to positively direct our sexual forces to create in the right way. Earlier I mentioned that there are two ways to polarize our energies. You can polarize them negatively or positively, upwards or downwards. And of course, negatively, we understand this is occurring through the regions of Lilith and Nahima. Positively, we're manifesting these energies upwards through Neshima and Nefesh, two parts of our own soul. So to understand that, to acquire that, to comprehend that, to in, enable that, we have to meditate. For our being, for our warrior, to conquer on the field of battle, we have to meditate. In his hands, he's demonstrating to us will, imagination, masculine, feminine, buddhi, manas. This is how the warrior works. In synthesis, we can say, in order to work with the force of Zayin, this seventh character related to Shabbat, we have to meditate. We have to transmute. We have to balance the masculine and feminine forces in our psyche, in our sex, in our soul, in our minds. What you see then, if we're working in this way, the descending creative forces represented by the character Vav, which descend through the auspices of those three forces, through Vav, to elaborate the structure. When we transmute, when we meditate, we're comprehending the nature of our mind. We're harnessing those forces in order to extract the pure forces of the being, from hell. We kill the enemy, Shaitan, and each of those brothers of ours that dies on the battlefield, we restore one piece of the being. That process of that returning energy flowing back upwards is Zayin. So we have the symbol of the infinite. Ascending and descending forces. That, of course, leads us to the number eight, which is next week's lecture. How that happens. Any questions?
you see the same thing on some of the other cards. In particular, number three. No, number two. The difference is, where are you in relation to that card? Let me see if I have the image here. Okay, here we have six. And here we have two. So if we look at number two, we'll find the answer to your question. The question is, why are the sphinxes on the sides that they are? If you look at Arcanum 2, you see the Divine Mother seated between two columns. On our right is a black one. But in the bottom, you see on our right is a white one. So what's the difference? The difference is there are two columns at the entrance of the temple. These two columns are called Jaquin and Boaz. They represent feminine and masculine sexual forces. Male, female. Man and wife. Father and mother. The entrance into the temple is through these columns. Which is a great symbol in itself. In other words, to enter into the temple of God you have to work with the masculine and feminine forces. Otherwise, alchemy or tantra. When you're standing outside of the temple, on your right is Jaquin, who's white, masculine, representing masculine aspect. And on your left is Boaz, representing the feminine aspect. But when you enter into the temple, you turn and face the other way, and now you see why the Divine Mother is that way. She's seated inside the temple. You see? From the bottom of number two, we're outside. And our job is to go inside next to the Divine Mother. In the same case with card number seven. We're seeing from the outside of the temple. But inside the temple is the being who's between these two pillars, the white and the black. So that's the basic meaning. So another question. Um, when, when an ego is like taking place with the warriors, where is the warrior during that time? Like, so you're saying when you're identified with an ego, where is the warrior? It's a good question. What do you think? If you have your consciousness vibrating with envy, can God enter into that? You can't. That's the problem. God and the devil cannot mix. So when we are vibrating consciously, energetically, with lust, when we're identified with lust, God is not there. Now this takes a little subtlety to grasp. Because God is always with us. Up to a certain point. But God does not participate in the actions of the ego. So when we're identified with an ego and we're acting, even if that action is just mental, we're thinking about a resentment or we're thinking about an envy, it is our will which is taking those forces and energies and directing them in accordance with the desire of that ego. God is not involved in that. That's our will. If we want God to be present, we have to separate from that ego and observe it. This is the power that meditation provides. You can never develop that without meditation. It's impossible. The reason is that ego exists in very deep levels of the mind. Without meditation, you cannot see that. You can't penetrate it. You can't observe it. You can't separate from it fully. 
So the, question, the answer to the question becomes a matter of subtlety. You may have something. Let's return to envy. A, a feeling of envy. You see someone doing something that you want to do. You want to be admired like so-and-so. With full identification with that, without any separation at all, God is not there. God is with you. God knows what you're doing, but he's not participating in that action. But if you begin to observe yourself, then you start to bring the presence of your being into yourself. But as a matter of degree, how potent, how strong is that self-observation? Self-observation is one thing. That's just the action of observing, right? So that's a percentage, because you have to use your free consciousness to do that properly. Then you have self-remembering, which is the full remembrance of the being, which brings more. Because you can observe without remembering. You can observe yourself and not remember God. But when you observe yourself and you remember your being, there's more potency in the presence of that consciousness, which provides you with more insight, more intelligence, right? more of the influence of Neshima. However, when you meditate, when you sit, you meditate, and you observe that event, that scene, that desire, you're giving yourself the opportunity to isolate yourself from all the sensations that were previously calling your attention. This gives you more capacity to receive the influence and presence of your being. Because then he can take that free consciousness and extract it completely in order to teach you. You follow? Yes. Okay. Like during like meditation, is he, uh, like the warrior is at the wheel, basically. That's, that's your goal. Exactly right. The goal of meditation is to let the warrior ro- drive the chariot, which is the soul itself, which is all of us. Ultimately, the goal is for the warrior, the innermost, to live in the chariot 24 hours a day so that all of our actions are his actions. But to do that requires full self-realization, which means that our false self has to completely die. This is not easy, and it's not overnight. It takes a lot of effort to acquire that, but it is achievable. The ones who do it are Buddha, Jesus, Krishna, Quetzalcoatl, Moses, they have achieved it. And you can see in them pure action of the being. No ego. And in that that case, you see that the warrior fully controls the chariot with no inhibition, no block, no obstacle. Exactly. Samadhi is a taste of the full presence of the being. And this is a mistake that many meditators fall into. The Master Samael on Vyor wrote many times that yogis develop the capacity to enter samadhi, but they mistake that for enlightenment, for self-realization. It's related because it's an experience of the, of the innermost. It's experience of the ecstasies of the soul which is beautiful and important, but is not self-realization. It's temporary. Full self-realization is that samadhi never ends. It's constant. So even sitting in the physical body and talking, samadhi, the full presence of the being. And it's the being who's talking. This was the case with the Master Samael on Vior. When he achieved the full incarnation of his innermost, of his being, of his father. It was not the personality, the terrestrial person who was talking. It was the monad. So that's something that any walker of the path can achieve, provided they're willing to die. That's where we all kind of hesitate. (laughs) We don't want to die. We want to get there the way we are. I want to take myself and become that. It doesn't work like that. Shiva are both 
refer to as a monad as well as in relationship to one another? Okay, the question is about how it is that the, the innermost or monad, Atman, can be the self, but also Bina or Hakma or Keter can also be the self. When we study Kabbalah, we're studying levels of the being. In particular, we have to understand that the tree of life, the way we normally study it, which has ten spheres, is actually a simplified tree. It demonstrates or represents a simplified order or a simplified structure of the being. For example, in discussing the innermost, we talk about Chesed. But in truth, our being is much more than that. Our own inner father, our particular inner father, is Aurus. And when you understand how Aurus arrives or is unfolded, you have to look at not only just this tree of life, but the four worlds, which are really four trees, four complete trees of, of life. Then you start to see that the being or the innermost is far more sophisticated, or you could even say elaborate, than just the simplified order of steps that we generally discuss. And that's because, really, even though this sounds all complicated, this is kindergarten. What we're, what we're elaborating in our studies of Kabbalah is only the beginning. It's the kindergarten. And as overwhelmed as we can be and as lost as we can become in all the concepts and words and names, it's far more complicated than, it, than it's being presented here. So the innermost is our individual divine father. But that innermost is an unfolding or an expression of his inner father, who's in truth ours as well. So in synthetic terms, or Kabbalistic terms, the Master Samuel and Vior will refer to these different levels of the being as his father in order to simplify it, in order not to freak you out. <laughs> but in truth, when you enter into deeper levels of understanding the Kabbalah, and deeper levels of your own experience, you will encounter your own being in many forms, with many manifestations, with many faces. And this is also represented in the Bhagavad Gita. Arjuna asks Krishna, show me your true form. I don't understand. He says, I don't get it, how my soul works. What is the structures of my soul? How can I comprehend that? You say you're this, you say you're that, you say you're all these different things in me, but I don't understand what that means. Can you show me? So Krishna says, okay, I've never shown anyone this, but I'll show you. And he unfolds and demonstrates himself in his complete aspect. And you'll see these paintings in India of this huge figure which has millions of faces and arms and legs. That's the being. The being is not a one personality. The being has many aspects. And the work of self-realization is to unify them. That is the work, to make them one. And the Master Samael says, in reality, the being represents an army of ineffable children. And to understand that requires meditation. So you can't simplify it to just one sphere or another sphere. The being is all of the tree. But all of the tree, each part of the tree has levels too. Question? When did one incarnate the monad, I said? With resurrection. When, when one resurrects, one has incarnated the monad. In reality, the work on the path of initiation is stage by stage, little by little. There are portions and parts of the being or the innermost which enter into the soul 
in stages. But the being himself, the full manifestation, cannot occur if the ego is there. And the ego is not dead until the soul resurrects. The two pillars that are mentioned in the Invocation of Solomon are Jachin and Boaz. They are also the two pillars on the tree of life, on either side. To be led betwixt the two pillars is to work with the mysteries of Yasod. We're the physical body, right? The physical person. We work with the mysteries of Yasod, the lower Eden, which are sexual. Through Tifereth, through our will, through the human soul, Entering into that, which are the mysteries of the upper Eden, sexual transmutation, in order to reach Keter, the Father. So that's the meaning of that invocation. To walk between these two pillars means to have equilibrium of wisdom and love, mercy and severity, to have balance, to stand on both the right and left legs. It's not easy. Another question? Yes. Mm-hmm. About the middle of that is a statement. Um, okay. The Arhan who arrives to the world of the mystical fire is one step towards the eighth and ninth initiations at the fundamental root of the hierarchy. Mm-hmm. These heights are reached by practicing sexual magic or by vowing to a total and definitive abstention and by walking the path of hope. Mm-hmm. This would seem to contradict okay. about everything else. Right. So the question is about a passage that's quoted on the website in, in the materials for this lecture about walking the path of perfect purity. Right. This, is, this passage is indicating aspects of the work related to the eighth and ninth initiations, right? which means that someone has to have already accomplished the first seven. What that passage is pointing at are the two forms of brahmacharya, solar and lunar. Brahmacharya means chastity or celibacy or to restrain the sexual force. Solar brahmacharya is what is indicated in that passage, that an initiate who's achieved the creation of the soul through sexual alchemy, and created the bodies, and elaborated the the chariot, can then renounce the sexual act and work in that way, what's called the dry path. And there are many masters who choose that. Lunar brahmacharya, on the other hand, is to renounce the sexual act without having created the soul, which means that the person does not accomplish any of the inner creations. An example of this is Yogananda. So you have two different ways of renouncing sex, but that passage in particular is talking about solar brahmacharya, as far as I understand it. Was there another question? No? Um, is, could you say that the vitriol is kind of like uh, the Lord's Prayer? Like- very much. Vitriol is very much like the Lord's Prayer. In the sense that It has seven aspects, which both prayers have, seven parts. And that in itself contains a mystery. If you look at the illustration related to vitriol, you see that it's a star of seven points related to seven planets, and in the center is a face, right? And that symbol is very similar to the wisdom encoded in the Lord's Prayer which is something that you have to meditate on in order to comprehend. But in essence, yeah, the two are very much the same. They are um, kind of like a koan, kind of like doorways that you can use in meditation. So if you meditate, you relax, and you concentrate yourself, you can enter into the understanding of what is encoded in that, in the vitriol or in the, the Lord's Prayer. Does that answer your question? Another one? Um, well, it's 
talks about the, the uh, mantra Henry, mm -hmm. and it cars, seven, uh, corresponds to seven chakras. Mm -hmm. The last one, it says, uh, uh, on, on Ra, it says pulmonary chakras, memory of past lives. I think pulmonary refers to the lungs. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That's right. Pulmonary chakras are related to the lungs. No, no, pulmonary is related to the lungs. So that, that particular sound, the ah sound, is related to the lungs. So when you elaborate the seven vowels, I left. You, those seven vowels relate to seven primary chakras, right? And the ah is the lungs. Where would that be on the, the spinal column? Well, it's close to the lungs. There is a church in the lungs which has... Related to the lungs. Yeah, in that area, that region. This is the other thing about the law of seven. When you look at really any, any esoteric tradition, you see seven everywhere. Seven notes, seven chakras, seven bodies, seven words. The number seven and the number three are the two most predominant numbers in the Bible. If you do an analysis of what's in the Bible, those two numbers appear more than anything else. And there's a reason for that. It's because the laws of three and seven are the fundamental laws of creation and organization. And the book of the Bible begins with Genesis creation and is all about the, the structure or the organization of the soul. So it's important. Another question? meaning of the, uh, the black shulamite, which is the, like the drawing. I have to point that question at my uh, comrade in arms over here. He has more understanding of those things than I do. So we'll come to that in a moment. But I think we'll close the lecture. And thank you all. And we will continue again next week. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.